Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Sri Ayer. Today I have the pleasure of company of Padma Bhushan Awardi Dr. R Nagaswami. Dr. Nagaswami, namaskaram and welcome to P Guru's channel. Namaskaram, namaskaram. Very glad to be back. Uh thank you sir. It's always a honor and a privilege to have you on a hangout with uh, P Guru's. Now um Dr. Nagaswami you are 91 years young and you see you show no signs of slowing in fact uh, you are today going to be sharing your thoughts on your latest book called Dharma Yoga uh, ladies and gentlemen viewers this is an astonishing piece of work i have done a little bit of work reading it and i have been astounded by the dedication the passion dr nagaswami brings to his writing dr nagaswami would you be kind enough to show us the book please could you lift it a little bit sir could you lift it a little bit sir a little bit more thank you thank you there you go that viewers you can see it it is called dharma yoga it is a pretty hefty book how many pages is it sir 400 it's 400 pages and it's got some brilliant brilliant photographs and also it talks about the yoga the dharma yoga that existed for thousands of years all the way from greece all the way to indonesia and and uh, dr nagaswami will you please share with our viewers how you came about to write this book sir well we have been uh... studying inscriptions of south east asia india and also west asia including central asia where you have got uh, inscriptions manuscripts and uh, coins and so on and it was amazing to see how the whole of asia followed one system of uh, conduct uh, polity personal polity of individuals especially based on one of the earliest law giver of the world manu manu dharma shastra manu uh, defines what is dharma there are even hesitations uh, in modern times what is dharma some people even also not uh, like to uh, take uh, dharma as an important one what is dharma he defines it and that doesn't um, uh, depict uh, worship of any individual god any personal god any sectarian god but it defines what are the important good qualities a man should have and if every man in the country could follow that that country would be a great country of prosperity civilized world and so he has given objective 10 points which he calls dasa lakshana manu calls dharma as dasa lakshana consisting of dritti uh, this is number 1 steadfastness this is one quality steadfastness then shama forbearance three dama control of your mind mental control and then asteya not stealing other man's property and saucha purity purity in thought word and deed then indriya nigra control of your senses different senses indriya indriya nigra satyam truth and then d intelligence vidya you are learning and akrodha and not getting angry with everything so these are the 10 qualities which he calls dharma which one should acquire and if all try to follow this then that will be wonderful wonderful country and so manu 
the earliest lawgiver of India, who could be uh, dated to uh, around uh, the pre-Christian era. He gives this, and he says that this should be followed. So the entire uh, lifestyle of Hindus is based on this Manu Dharma Shastra. Both at the beginning and at the end of his text, he says that what it gives you is Sama Darsana, looking at everything with equality of mind. No difference between man and man. There is no question of higher caste or lower caste. There is no question of man and women like that. All are equal before the eye of law. And that's what Manu preaches. And that was the basis on which all the kings of India, from northern part to southern part, from Assam to Punjab and even beyond, they follow. And this book is about that. It did not confine itself only to India, only to Indian state, but it went beyond. And we have solid evidences to show that this dharma of Manu went to Western Asia, right up to Macedonia, Alexandria, and even part of uh, what you call Italy, and then Central Asia, along the uh, Silk Route, and then through the Silk Route, it went into China, and uh, Japan, Korea, Outer Mongolia, and then down south in Southeast Asia, like Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Indonesia, and Sri Lanka, Malaysia, and so on. So the whole of Asia, the uh, whole of Asia followed this uh, from very early times. That is what is being discussed. So this is a new approach to the study of history of any country, particularly in Asia, that we should not confine ourselves to only one small area, India, Burma, Thailand, and so on. We have to study it in the larger context of all of Asia. How one concept, the way of life, is practiced by uh, the evidences we have we can show in archaeological evidences, epigraphical evidences, literary evidences, and uh, inscriptional evidences, and numismatic evidences, and also uh, uh, the visitors, foreign visitors, notes, and uh, all these go to show that this great uh, law of Manu, Dharma of Manu, the Ten Commands of Manu went uh, uh, right across, right across to uh, Axila, Afghanistan, Balochistan, Bactria, and uh, Indo-Greek country, and then Macedonia, Babylonia, Alexandria, and the east of Italy, in all these places, that this dharma has been taken. And we have a picture of reference to show that uh, uh, Indian uh, ambassadors sent by the great Maurya king, Asoka, went to all these places and they preached uh, the, uh, what you call, the conquest of territory is not great. Conquest of mind is important. Conquest of control is important. And that what uh, was aimed at by Asoka and he specifically mentioned all. So on the basis of all this, this book tries to show that we have to study the life. Each area has its own language. Each area has its own limitation. But the culture remains the same. So it is amazing to see with actual data that there is one culture toward Asia. That's what I am trying to show in this particular Amazing, sir. 
um, the the book I I had the opportunity of looking at some of the pictures, and I thought I saw some Greek coins with Greek on one side and Brahmi on the other side. Um, can did you decipher that, sir? What does it mean in the Brahmi script? No, it is not. Uh, I who deciphered it. There are other numismatic scholars who have already deciphered them. I am coming to that. Maybe I can take it up as the first one. Yeah. Now we have a large number of coins: uh, gold, silver, and occasionally bronze also, which have been found in West Asia. More than nearly uh, 50 issues of different. Uh, Uh, kings and rulers have come to light, and these show on one side the king, portrait of the king, the Greek king, and also his name in Greek characters. And on the reverse, we have uh, early, in the early coins. We have the Greek kings and uh, Greek uh, characters, but from third century. End of third century BC or beginning of the second century BC, you have Indian uh, king uh, and Indian characters which are written there, uh, and they refer to the name of the king. The the king is uh, Greek, but the name is in Maharaja the Raja sir, Agathocles sir. This is one of the kind of example. For example. Agatha Clie was a Bactrian king. He ruled around about 280 BC, and he issued the coin. On one side, his portrait is there; his name is there in Greek, and on the reverse, we have this in what we call Karosti inscription. Karosti is one form of script that is uh, written from right to left, while The other script is called Brahmi script, which was used throughout India from the time of Ashoka. That is written from left to right. So one is in Prakrit language. When there is Prakrit language to be employed, they uh, use this, and uh, also uh, Brahmi characters. In Agatha Clie's coins, we have Brahmi characters. And this was in Bactria issued by. What is amazing is not only the name of the king, name or the title in Prakrit uh, Maharaja Adi Raja Sya Agatha Kliya Sya, but the figure that is portrayed is Indian gods and goddesses. We have one of the very good uh, illustration of Agatha Kliya's coin. Uh, in which, uh, on the obverse, you have the king's portrait and Greek character, and on the reverse, we have uh, 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 goddess Durga. Another coin has got uh, Shiva standing before uh, bull Nandi. But the most important one is both obverse and reverse have got Indian god. One side is Krishna. Standing in uh, great attire, great dress, and holding a big sacre in his left hand, and a kaan in his right hand, and to his right, in Brahmi characters, we have the name of the Greek king Agatha Christie. It is written there, and on the reverse, amazingly, we have. Balrama. On one side we have Krishna, and the other side we have Balrama, who is also standing exactly like Krishna, in Greek attire, holding a plow, which is a symbol, and also the script written there is Greek. It reads Agatha Christie. So on on the opposite side we have Krishna, and the reverse side we have Balrama. One side you have Brahmi characters, and the other side you have uh, Greek characters. Like this, not one or two. 
there are several several points which have come to light issued by all the uh, rulers of bactria indo greek uh, saka rulers kushan rulers and others but these all begin from our old third fourth century bc and uh, but very much really the 14th century bc in mesopotamia on the uh, banks of euphrates we have two uh, dynasties mitannis and hittite they were on both sides of the uh, euphrates the river side and uh, they entered into a contract and that contract was a treaty that hence for that we and the both countries will never fight each other we will always live together and we will see that our subjects uh, live in prosperity and harmony and so we pray to this is most important the treaty is still there is there in the british museum they say that we pray to mitra varna indra surya agni and nasatya nasatya the rajshuni devata so these two territories two kings in 14th century bc they invoke the vedic god like indra uh, mitra varuna and so on which shows that indian concept has gone there so much so it's not only in the uh, treaty they say that these are the deities which protect our law in veda mitra is prescribed as a protector of law and so that they have taken the legal concept also in india and they have included prayers to these gods which show that there has been intimate contact between the punjab and uh, gangetic uh, region uh, traveling towards uh, traveling to mesopotamia and then it is not only in uh, what you call the treaty but also in the name of the kings the capital name is vasu gani one, one of the towns and one two three four like this numerals they are all as uh, in vedic um, uh, literature and also uh, the king's titles so there is very close intimate between the, the, the modern era the modern era and iraq era that place they had intimate contact and that contact came from vedic india and so 14th century bc bc g we have the contact between these two region and in between in between was mostly uh, hilly region uh, forest region but after this we have alexander the great he wanted to conquer conquer the whole of uh, west asia go up to india and go up to the sea but unfortunately when he reached the punjab is in jhelum river region his commanders refused to go because they have been out of that country for more than 6 or 7 years and so they refused to go so he was forced to go back his idea was to uh, unite all these area territories into one but when he came to uh, babylonia he died so all these are discussed in this uh, book how uh, alexander wanted to unify whole of asia but he could do uh, only up to right up to uh, the jhelum river punjab region uh, but subsequently it was um, ashok maurya who came into power uh, he was in uh, the king of magadha in bihar patali putra and he his rule extended right up to baluchistan and uh, gandhara region when the earliest inscription of ashoka which speaks of uh, dharma 
dharma should be spread dharma should be followed and what is the dharma he said this is the old ancient tradition paurani prakriti this is the ancient tradition that must be followed and he wrote his edict in somewhere between persia and uh, bactria in bilingual uh, characters one was written in aramic character and the other one was written in greek character and from that time onwards till the end of his rule he went on sen- sending officers who were specially appointed to spread the message of dharma they were called dharma mahamatra he specifically mentions the kingdom that were in asia west asia like alexandria then he also talks about macedonia then maga then bactria yavana and other places and he named five kings who were his contemporaries antiochus and ptolemy maga these are all the kings who were there to whom he sent his ambassador to preach dharma dharma mahamatra there and everywhere we have uh, uh, this is referred to and in all is all is inscription in india uh, in the north west he wrote them in karosti script and in india he wrote them in brahmi script all indian scripts today prevalent are all evolved from what uh, uh, ashok wrote in uh, in in the 3rd century bc in north eastern continent so that was a place where prakrit was made a classical language in taxila by panini and also patanjali who wrote uh, the yoga sutra also assigned to by some to that place to that area but in tamil nadu we have another tradition that patanjali was in chidambara uh, who wrote about uh, the dance of shiva and that is connected with yoga so we have two important concepts one is dharma the dharma is of manu the 10 commands of manu uh, that is dharma and as i told you they are not uh, any uh, uh, related to any one particular religion one particular god one miracle nothing it is the quality beautiful quality that you have to imbibe and that is what dharma and that dharma leads on to what you call the uh, <coughs> yoga patanjali yoga both dharma and yoga are derived from vedic tradition in in taitri upanishad siksha valli it is said dharmam chara chatyam vada so this is what has been adopted and both are from that and without dharma you don't uh, dharma is the initial stage and yoga is dharana dhyana and samadhi or the second where you get the knowledge the awakening liberation buddha gautama buddha followed this system of dharma and also uh, the yoga of patanjali patanjali is yoga so you see him in all his in all the uh, sculptural portrayal which came at late there he is shown as yogi mahayogi seated in padmasana with his hand in dhyana pose so this is the yoga system so dharma and yoga were one and the same part of the discipline and then buddha buddha's teachings reached central asia 
there is a place called the Nia in Central Asia on the main uh, Silk Route from uh, West Asia to China. There, as early as 1903, uh, oral science, sir, oral science surveyed that and he brought to light several important uh, written manuscripts in Prakal, Central Asia, near, in, near uh, Tashkent, uh, almost uh, near Tashkent. And there, in 1990s, a uh, team of archaeologists from China and Japan went in again and surveyed that. They got nearly 52 man bundles of manuscripts written in excellent Prakrit and also some almost reaching towards Sanskrit. So we have 1st, 2nd century AD, what you call CE, 1st, 2nd century, there was a very strong center of Buddhism in Central Asia. And through that, many scholars from Kashmir, went into China and from China they came to Kashmir and came to India. From 3rd century, 4th century, we have one Kumara Jiva. He was a Kashmiri. He went to uh, China through this route and uh, he came to uh, India. He studied Sanskrit from that time onward. Uh, Sanskrit became very perfected language, easy for all people in all regions to understand. So he studied Sanskrit, went back to China on the back of his horse, and where the horse died uh, en route, and he built a memorial. That that memorial is still there in China, and that was the fourth century. Then in fifth century we have uh, uh, Bodhi Dharma. Bodhi Dharma is said to be a king, uh, a prince from South India, a prince of the Pallava family. He studied Sanskrit and when went to China, carrying a large number of these texts, Buddhist texts in Sanskrit, and translated them into China. And there he established Chang Buddhism. Chang Buddhism is what is called Dhyana Yoga Buddhism. Dhyana, Dhyana is Dhyana Chang. And uh, so he was held in great uh, esteem. He was considered almost an incarnation of Buddha. He is a very popular uh, uh, Buddhist monk, uh, 4th century and 5th century. 5th century, we had one, another great uh, traveler from China to South India. Fahiyan. Fahiyan is an amazing personality, walking right through the rugged roots of uh, Himalayan base. He reached India, uh, walking you know, by foot, and he studied six different systems of Buddhism uh, in Sanskrit. And then he went further down south, right up to Kanchipuram, even to Nalanda and Kanchipuram. And then he went also Sri Lanka, where there is a cave, which is still considered or called Fakian Cave. So he went back and translated many of these Sanskrit texts. And uh, he was another contributor to uh, enrichment of, of this culture. There. Then we have uh, uh, the great Yuan Swam. In the 7th century, he came, he came down south and he was received by all the uh, Buddhist uh, monasteries. Some, he found that they, they were uh, filled with many, many uh, Buddhist monks coming from different parts and learning Buddhism. Some were already getting uh, uh, evacuated and the Buddhists were moving away from that place and so on. We have almost eyewitness account in his writings. And these masters of those periods, 3rd century, 4th century, 5th century, 6th century, 
they have brought india and china to so such a close the contact amazing and they were contributed to the unity of all of asia in, at that particular time so from second century first century to almost seventh century we have continuous strain of uh, the uh, uh, dharma and yoga one question dr nagaswami uh, i know of hinayana and mahayana buddhism you mentioned there are six types of buddhism what are the other four sir no there are i see mainly two basic divisions are mahayana and hinayana hinayana is the old conservative form when uh, buddha teachings were only maintained by hearing and uh, no image of buddha was uh, worship those days but hinayana Uh, was uh, confined to some place. But Mahayana became a greater uh, concept among the Buddhists, and they imbibed from Sanskrit, mostly Sanskrit tradition, and so all over North India, Kashmir, and uh, Central Asia, and then China and uh, Japan, and also Southeast Asia, like uh, what you call Thailand. Cambodia and uh, Vietnam and uh, Indonesia and so on. So other things are schools, you know, different schools in different places. For example, we have uh, many great uh, centers in Andhra Pradesh, like Amaravati, Nagarjunakunda. In the yeah. second century inscription, we have in Nagarjunakunda. nagarjuna um, kunda there's one one lady from the merchant community bodhisri she erected a chaitya for the buddhist monk and there was one achanda acharya there a great uh, buddhist scholar and she provided fund for students to come from different parts of the world and there is specific mention from china from gandhara from taxila china is in the east and gandhara and the taxila are in the west and then um, to tosali and what is amazing is one from dramila that is tamil country so it was an international school of buddhism and there different uh, various uh, views of uh, these scholars and they call it a different schools they talk one is of course the well known yoga chara one emphasizes jnana the other one emphasizes yoga and uh, he jnana is the dhan worship about the image of us do it dhan worship images now everything has become common for all these but mahayana outpouring in sanskrit in poetry Uh, many 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 texts are there which are mostly now also in tibet they are not to be found in india sanskrit texts in tibet so there is an institution tibetan institution carrying it from tibet on to sanskrit in uh, um, sarnath in nirva so these uh, movement of um, buddhist carrying the buddha dharma which is based on earlier existing dharma that spread to china and that went to from there it went to uh, uh, what was japan at japan they are almost even now followed today and you have all the deities mentioned in temple worship of hindu gods uh, you see there and in india if you see in the middle part the 9th 10th or 11th century great temples of vishnu with the image in the center which portray dasavatara 10 avatar all around the prabha the ninth incarnation is always shown as buddha so hindus worship the buddha in the garbagriha in india there is no difference there it has become integrated into one and as far down south in tamil nadu 
in Mahabalipura. There is Dasavatara is mentioned where Buddha Kalki Dasasmrita. There is an inscription which says the Buddha is one of the avatars of Vishnu. These went through Prakrit and through Sanskrit, through Silk Route to China and uh, uh, other Eastern India. But we have also evidences of uh, sea route from South India and uh, coastal area, coastal India. People have moved on to Thailand, uh, what you call Burma, uh, Malaysia, Thailand, and uh, Laos. Then you have uh, th what you call uh, <coughs> Khmer, which is uh, Angkor. There, it is a, a Sanskrit tradition which, which went there. Right up to 14th century, it was the Dharma. And we have we, we have the kings who mentioned that he was another Manu which is, who is ruling this country. In Sanskrit, he is Manu River Aparaha. He is another Manu who is ruling that. So, Southeast Asia, the kings in their own orders, they have mentioned they followed the rule of Manu, particularly in Thailand and Cambodia. And uh, which is not only the mentioning, but the kings followed strictly what is given in Manu Dharma. The kings, the rulers who ruled the country after enjoying all the power and the age and pleasures for up to certain age, must relinquish it and go to the forest region, which is called Vanaprastha state in uh, Manu Dharma. And we have many kings in their inscription say they followed that. After ruling effectively, powerfully, they relinquished their rulership, handed it over to their successor and went to the forest. And they give a graphic account of how they followed each and every prescription of Manadharma and sacrificed their life in the day. It is there in Thailand. Such uh, inscriptions are there due in beautiful Sanskrit in Cambodia. What an amazing unity, right from Italy, right from uh, what you call Macedonia, Greece, and so on, across, across this uh, area, West Asia, and then India, and the Southeast Asia. All these places have imbibed one system which is more than two to three thousand years old, Manadharma. We come to, chronologically, two other great religions. One is the Jewish religion. Jewish religion has got two traditions. One tradition takes uh, the Ten Commandments of their Bible to around, uh, say, a thousand uh, BC something. And the, but the second one, which is more popular now, which is a, that is from Babylonia, which is said to be third, fourth century BC. This by this time, already the Indian uh, tradition, the ten commands of Manu has come and reached and uh, become part of this West Asia, and that is influenced because if you read the uh, Jewish Ten Commandments Bible. It's the same. What you say here as Mata Pitrushu Susru Shitavyam. Worship thy father and mother. And it's the same thing there. Don't tell lie. There also it says, don't tell lie. Don't steal. Here it says, uh, Manu says, don't steal. There also they say, don't steal. So almost exactly repetition of what is found in the Manu Dharma, which is at least thousand years earlier than. Jewish uh, 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 Bible, and finally, it is the Christian uh, Bible, which also says Ten Commandments, and we know, everybody knows, that it is derived from Jewish uh, Bible. Christian Bible is uh, derived from Jewish Bible. 
and it is the same it also repeats the same thing so we are convinced there has been a migration perceptible migration with evidence to show that uh, the, the, the cultured civilized manu dharma and ten command the selection of manu has moved towards the west and gone right up to uh, italy and that is what is discussed in this uh, i have given the original what is the <coughs> source uh, uh, the illustration and also uh, the reports of foreign travelers and so on so that all statements in this book are based on verifiable data to ensure that it is necessary that we study the whole of asian con asian countries and the religion there may be some variations here and there regional variations there but the core of it can be traced to india manu dharma that is what is here discussed that was a wonderful um, description of what is in your book dharma yoga dr nagaswami i have one question for you sir can we approximately date when manu lived well <clears throat> there are two sources one is in bhagavad gita krishna says i gave this to your swan this dharma i gave this to vivaswan and vivaswan gave it to manu and manu gave it to ikshvaku and all others who came kings who came subsequent to them and uh, they followed it and then many of it were forgotten and so but uh, it was used by the kings and so on. so if you take uh, what you call the two representation in agathocles coins third century bc where krishna is portrayed and krishna bhagavad gita should be dated to earlier than third century bc now <clears throat> there is one inscription very important inscription in shanti there is a big buddhist stupa where there is an entrance entrance with torana there there is an inscription which says if anybody tries to steal the card with this stone he will fall into the sin of destroying acharya kula acharya kula is a division used by apastamba apastamba is it is another logic eh? who manu say the four ashramas brahmachari grihastha vana prastha and sanyasi but apatamba he gives acharya kula not brahmachari so this is there are many other there are nearly 15 to 16 law givers in ancient time but apatamba is one of the earlier and he is the only person who says the brahmachari state is called acharya kula so it is very clear that apatamba was earlier than 3rd century bc from inscriptions we know so it may be 4th fifth century he refers to gautama gautama rishi was another great lawgiver and he lived nearly 500 600 years earlier than apatamba so he has to be placed somewhere about 8th century manu himself some people place him in 8th century but this one uh, i want to call them krishna is this thing aham vivashyate pratham aham manave pratham manuhu ikshva kavi abhrivi evam parampara praptam idam rajarishiyo vidhu says gita this is uh, number 1 but um, <coughs> other texts also say that uh, there is an interesting inscription in again in nagarjuna kunda which says 
that Buddha was born in the family of Ikshvaku. Ikshvaku Vamsa Prabhavaha. This is Rama, Sri Rama, born as, uh, in the family of Ikshvaku. So Ikshvaku learned it from Man. So he should be earlier, earlier than uh, what you call a uh, Ikshvaku. Man so, should uh, be one, one, uh, 1000 BC earlier than Man. Yes. You have to place him. Yes. But some people place him in the 8th century BC, not later than 8th century BC. So all the all the other basis of this study is on Manu, Manu's dating and uh, relative dating of other lawgivers, and then I come to the um, Dr. Nagaswamy, uh, there is a song, I think, by Bhakta Ramdas, who used to live in Badrachalam. He is 15th century, I think. And he says, Ikshva Kula Tilaka uh, to describe Rama. Now, if we look at some of the scientific dating, like looking at the Rama Setu bridge and things like that, it places Ramayana at, uh, like the birth of Rama at is 5110 BCE. So Ikshvaku was perhaps five or 10 generations before Rama and Manu was even beyond that. So I would say probably 6000 BCE. Yeah. See, see what Rama followed is Manu Dharma. Yes. So he is earlier than Rama. So no, no I told you about that uh, Nagarjuna Kunda inscription. Yes. Where Buddha, Buddha, he said, Ikshvaku Vamsatrabhaha. So it is clear that he, he was uh, uh, later than Ikshvaku. And uh, Krishna said, he gave it to uh, Vivaswan, Vivaswan gave it to uh, Manu. So Manu, there are eight Manus. Uh, Manus are there. So, this is uh, Vaivasata Manu. The last one is the Vaivasata Manu. And uh, he was the giver of this Manu Darsana, Manu Darsana. And he is, he is the earliest, earliest law text in the world, which could be dated somewhere. We have some more, but they are all chronologically later. So what? Manu is earlier than Buddha. Yes. So um, you know, in today when we perform pujas, we we always say Vaivasata Manvantare. Is that relating to the same uh, Manu? Yeah, we say, yeah, this is the same Manu who has given whose law which we follow. Even to this day we follow. You see, Manu Dharma in Assam. In 5th century, the king said, I followed Manu. In Bengal, 6th century, king said, I followed Manu. In Magadha, Birla, Bihar, he says, I followed Manu. So all people mention Manu and that they follow. And what they call themselves is Dharma Maharaja Raja. That we are the protectors of Dharma. And they came from that. You know the great kings. In Tamil Nadu, Cholas, Cholas in all their inscriptions describing the early uh, kings of their family, they say they came in the family of Manu. So Manu, and then they came in the Ikshvaku, and they were the descendants of Rama ruling Tamil Nadu as the Cholas. That is why we have. Uh, Manu has to be played much earlier than Buddha and uh, Rama and others. Uh, we need more studies. We need we need to study all aspects. But unfortunately, in India, right up to almost Ahimsa, Paramo Dharma, Mahatma Gandhi, till the date of Mahatma Gandhi, we laid on. Emphasis is the Nahimsa or the Manu's uh, code. 
after independence, we were thrown him into dustbin, unfortunately. Nobody knows who is Manu. What is the outcome? Today there is a discussion about what is uh, what is called secularism. What is secularism? Read the dictionary. The dictionary is a secularism means anti religious. Anti religious. So a country which has preserved for the past three to four thousand years a, a continuum tradition simply just through the dharma. I don't think the word dharma appears in Indian constitution today. And our courts are very in, very much interested in interpreting it in terms of what uh, some judge in England say and what is a shared meaning of a European meaning for their judgment. But none knows what is Indian dharma. None knows Manu. The word dharma doesn't come at all in the uh, constitution. Very unfortunate. Uh, so there is a need to understand what is its contribution. Not necessarily that everything is great. Everything is not great in everything. If you take anything, you can show you the lapses everywhere. But you have a tradition. You, you, you have a heritage. You want to say that you have a heritage. But what is the heritage? The heritage is all these I guess, uh, useless things that is being now perpetrated. And it is necessary. So I will tell you one small example. I think I must record it. I must say that. And I went to London to give evidence in the London Natraja case. Justice Ayon Kennedy was the justice who was here in the case. The first day when he came, he knew nothing about India. He knew nothing about Indian art. But after one month of hearing and inquiry, he has mastered Indian art, he has mastered Indian temple culture, and is, is, is what you call judgment is based on what is relevant to Indian context. But nowadays, nowadays, uh, your own tradition is not known. It's not emphasized. We do something else somewhere else. What, what a poor man in village, he doesn't know what is going on in the um, court. It is unfortunate that our own traditions are not understood. And this tradition, even now, we emphasize Samadharsa. What Mahatma Gandhi said was Samadharsa, Ahimsa. So uh, the study is not to glorify any region or any people or any particular sect or something, like that, but to use it for present day life to see harmonious living, happy living, prosperous living, and not utilize it to denigrate one section of the society against the other. So these studies are required to show that there was a unity, that people have understood the value of the Dharma system. And we must see that somewhere in the higher institutions of learning, this is given proper place to understand. That was a wonderful talk, uh, Dr. Nagaswamy. And viewers, you may have read the preface of this book, which was presented as two parts in uh, P Gurus. And uh, once again, uh, I think uh, we also mentioned there, uh, Dr. Nagaswamy, if you could just refresh my memory, just like, you know, Brahmi and then Prakriti became what is the basis for all the newer languages in India, even uh, Khmer also is supposed to be derived from that, Devanagari and other scripts. Karoshti is the precursor for Arabic and Hebrew. Can we say that? It is writing. It's only writing. It's not a language. Right. Yes, yes, yes. Only a script. Script, script. That's Rami what I mean. Is script. Yes. See, the same script undergoes through the centuries variation in writing. Right. And uh, sometimes it goes beyond what was the origin. So uh, if, you, if, you, if you take India, 
our Southeast Asian schools, all these Southeast Asian scripts, all I would say, okay, Sri Lankan script, all scripts of India in different states, they all were derived from Brahmi, the of Ashoka. Now, uh, in the international field, they are establishing institutes of what they call Gandharan practice. Look at that, Gandharan practice. Because Gandharan area beyond uh, Punjab and uh, Pakistan, that has a very rich prakrit uh, depicted in uh, inscriptions and also in uh, coins. So the world is setting up institution for studying and uh, it is necessary that we also think in terms of having these type of international institutions which can study and not glorify one small region. Uh, this is the greatest, this is the world, that's, what does it matter whether it is yesterday or 1000 years earlier. What is important is what is its contribution? This is required. And uh, we need a, a great institution to study Asia as a whole. I think we will have a different perspective of the world. Yes, indeed. It is like going back to our roots. And uh, once again, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Nagaswamy. Um, you are the inspiration for me to keep writing, sir. I hope to accomplish half or even probably less than that of what you have done in your rich career. And uh, once again, thank you very much and all, wish you all the best for your new book, Dharma Yoga. Namaskaram. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.